Howdy. Um, so I want to talk for a minute about what I did and didn't say about James and Psalms. Uh, just, I have a lot of, I'm getting more and more new subs that are coming furious. They're the, these people who are generously advertising my channel. <laughs> um, but the funny thing is, is they're displaying their character so badly that the people who are listening to them going, what happened to them? What in the world? This is totally ungodly. And then they're curious what I teach. So they come over here and then they end up liking some of the things they hear. So they stay. And it's been like this. This is sort of the, one of the reasons my channel has grown um, over the years. One of the ways it's grown is these groups will come after me and then it's like they shake the tree and, and the, the, the wheat falls out. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Um, okay. I have not said that James is not inspired and should not be in the ca canon. I've said Luther had it in the Apocrypha and said it was mostly straw because it didn't have anything Pauline in it and very little Jesus Christ in it. And that's true. Um, that it has very little Pauline in it and very little Jesus Christ in it. But um, I have taught on the inspiration of James numerous times um, that James has some of the most advanced statements on discipline and grace, if not the most advanced uh, statements on discipline and grace, where he talks about how even in your sin, when you have yielded and to the lust and the temptation and it's even brought forth death, you can ask wisdom of God and he gives liberally and without rebuke and he's the father of lights in him. There's no variance and shifting shadow and he doesn't tempt us, but only good and perfect gifts come from him and we're begotten of him. Uh, as a kind of first fruits of his creature, born of the word of truth. That's really edifying and New Testament. But James, like Peter at the time, was a mix of law and grace, just like the rest of the church in Jerusalem. And we know Peter at that time, when James was written, was in error. Uh, if you want to say error, but... It, it was really a growing knowledge of the truth and its implications. Um, and when he ended up in Antioch, he backslid. Uh, when J men from James came down to Antioch and um, he was intimidated and shrank back from meeting with the, with the Gentiles, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it was a big deal. And Paul rebuked him publicly in front of everyone for pretending to be something he's not because he was broadcasting that the Christian life is law after all. And that Gentiles are unclean and Jews have to keep the Levitical ordinances. Um, and Paul went so far as to say that he, uh, in a sense, was making Christ out to be a minister of sin. He said, you know, if I seeking to be justified... If while we're seeking to be justified in Christ, we are found to be sinners. Does that make Christ a minister of sin? God forbid. And uh, he really, at that, in the context of that rebuke, revealed the kernel of the Christian life, which is, I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live unto God. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but, the, but um, Christ in me. The life I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of Christ uh, or the grace of God for Christ, uh, for if righteousness came to the law, Christ died in vain. That was all in his rebuke to Peter. Um, and he said, Peter walked disorderly and not according to the truth of the gospel. Well, that was because of the situation in Jerusalem and what they believed at the time. And we know all from the book of Acts what they believed. They believed that Gentiles had to become Jews in Jerusalem, essentially. Um, and they 
while they didn't send those men out to circumcise Gentiles, they had much disputation about whether it should happen in Acts 15, and much disputation with Peter and Paul about justification to the point where Peter finally, this is after he's been rebuked by Paul and corrected, stood up to the whole church of Jerusalem and the elders and said, uh, why do you tempt God by putting a yoke on the Gentiles that we couldn't bear or our fathers? Don't you know that we have to be justified just as the Gentiles, apart from works, are without works, by faith? So he's correcting the concept in Jerusalem, not only that, uh, that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but even Jews are under the law. They actually still believe that they were under the law. Now, that's what you would naturally tend to believe if you didn't have the mystery of Christ in Paul's teachings, which they did not have yet. And this is called progressive revelation, meaning there were some things that God revealed after other things. He progressively revealed things. And there were things that he revealed to Paul that had not made it to Jerusalem from Paul's lips. It mainly made it from the lips of the accusers. And at the time James wrote his letter, he believed the same thing Peter believed, you know, which was, yes, we're justified by faith, but we have to keep the law. This is what the Christian life looks like. It looks like Judaism. It's just going to continue being Judaism while we wait for the hope of Israel, for Christ to come back and bring uh, seasons of refreshing um, to once Israel repents. They don't know the mystery that Paul revealed that, Gen that Israel has actually been cut off and that God's turning his attention to the Gentiles for quite some time. They couldn't even understand that at the time. They were surprised in Acts 10 that Gentiles, when, when the Holy Spirit fell on Ant, uh, on Cornelius' house, uh, just as in Acts 2, without any works, without baptism, without laying on of hands or anything, while he was preaching, which shows that the supply of the Spirit comes from the hearing of faith, not by the works of the law, which is the main point of Galatians, uh, they were surprised that Gentiles could be saved in that way. They thought they had to become proselytes or in some way attached to the church in Jerusalem and you lay hands on them or you acknowledge them in some way and then they begin a life of converting to Judaism. That's really what they thought. And that the Jews, their life would still consist of law keeping in some form. Uh, and uh, it's centered on the temple. And even in the synagogues, they're still in the synagogues listening to Moses. They're still in the temple. The apostles are meeting in the temple. So this is all just clear, clear cut history from the book of Acts um, and Galatians that gives the backdrop and tells us what they believed in Jerusalem at the time James was written. And yes, the Bible does preserve the, uh, ill-informed or not informed views of people who don't have all the truth yet. They don't have the whole story. Um, and so James is really a historical reflection of what they believed in Jerusalem at the time. Nobody teaches that. And, it, you know, all the commentaries come from the institutions and the institutions are mainly uh, work saturated you know, we've been talking about the history, Nicolaitans, Balaamites. Well, that's what they are. They're working for a wage, for the most part, in most of the commentaries we've received. And they have a natural view, a naturalistic view, devoid of the mystery of Christ. You know, a lot of people say James is practical. It's the practical Christian life. No, it's not. The practical Christian life begins with our death with Christ and our union with him, being made alive together with him, being raised up and seated with him in the heavenlies, and standing before God in Christ, accepted in the beloved, without spot. That's the beginning of the, and the, and the basis of the Christian, practical Christian life. And then we learn to walk in the spirit by faith, 
through the acknowledgement of the truth. Uh, and it is supernatural from start to finish. It is not ethical. It's not a something that you can teach a dog or a Mormon to do. You have to be regenerated. You have to be born again. And all Paul's practical Christian truth teaching comes uh, based on the assumption that the people he's writing to are born again and have the divine life in them and are focused on learning about their union with Christ as the way this works and their death with him. When Paul talks about dealing with sin, he talks about your death with Christ. James doesn't have that truth. It wasn't available at the time. It wasn't, in, it wasn't available in Jerusalem. They knew Christ rose and ascended, but they did not know they died with him and rose with him. They didn't know what the new creation was. They would have still thought of it in terms of the new covenant. That's another topic. But I have taught that James is inspired, uh, that I've used in my book, James Trouble, I used the two mirrors, the mirror that James shows of the natural man and his statements about you know, if you're not a doer of the word, uh, but a hearer only, you're like a natural man looking at his mirror, looking at the mirror at his natural face, and you've walked away and you've forgotten what kind of person you are. You take that with, look, if you break one point of the law, you've broken the whole thing. Also, James, the Holy Spirit is inspiring that to show you, look, you look in the natural man and you should be brought to a crisis. But if you walk away and you're not brought to that crisis, you're not a doer of the word. And not only that, but you've forgotten what your natural man was shown to be. The law should, only has one function, it's to judge you. Um, and that perfectly contrasts to Paul's mirror written about in 2 Corinthians years and years later, that we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed uh, from glory to glory into the same image. So there's two mirrors and two objects in the mirror and Paul's mirror is after the person is unveiled and is no longer looking through the law at himself but has been unveiled to behold the glory of Christ. In James, the man that he's talking about is still veiled. This is, That's the Holy Spirit. Um, but you can't ignore what he said in James 2 about justification and make it work under any circumstance, whether you create another dispensation where all he's speaking to the Jews and they're actually justified by works, or you create another kind of faith like the Calvinists have done where, well, it's not just head faith, it's heart faith and faith without works is dead. And so there's a living faith or a spurious faith and overthrow Paul's doctrine. Or what the free graces do, which is to create a new kind of justification by works under rewards on James. And to try to twist Paul's words in Romans 4, where he says, what could Abraham say? Uh, what is Abraham found according to the flesh? If he could be justified by works, he'd have something to glory, but not before God. They say that, that, that Paul is asking the question, who can he glory in front of? And the answer is man. No. His point is that Abraham cannot glory in front of anyone because he can't be justified. He hasn't found anything according to the flesh. The point is the flesh. And James doesn't know teach about the flesh and the spirit, and either do they. The, the reason James fits them exactly is because they don't understand Paul's writings. James had the... You can credit James and say, well, nobody had his writings. Peter didn't know. John didn't know. Nobody knew what the ascended Christ had revealed to Paul in Jerusalem. But these people are without excuse. That's what I say. I don't say that Paul uh, James is a false teacher or a false prophet or not a brother or a tear or a wolf. I say that he did not have the understanding of Paul's revelation and we don't know if he ever got it because most of the churches didn't and in Jerusalem there isn't any evidence that things had progressed from Acts 15 to Acts 21 it's the same thing when they get when Paul goes back to Jerusalem and if you haven't studied that history then shut up 
if you, you know, don't come to me and tell me that you're all about the word of God and you're protecting the word of God. And I'm saying there's errors in the word of God while you completely ignore what the word of God says about these things. Okay, so uh, I don't teach that James is a false brother or that it, it's not can canonical or that it shouldn't be doesn't teach anything no it it does but it teaches us along with many other things um the difference between law and grace you know uh, now as far as the psalms go i said that there are erroneous human sentiments in the psalms what do i mean by that well there's inspiration where god directly speaks prophetically through david my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool or uh, you are my son. This day I've begotten the direct actual, you know, vows to the seed of David from, from God. That's direct inspiration like Jeremiah. That's prophetic. Then there's prophecies and types where it's clearly he's, uh, you know, speaking of Christ. Uh, Psalm 22. Um you pier they pierce my hands and feet and I can count my bones and my heart is waxed within me and uh, they cast lots for my garment that's that is a, the gospel my God my God why have you forsaken me it starts with that um, those are prophecies okay so those are two different kinds of inspiration one is God directly speaking um, the other is a poetic prophetic insight of a seeking servant of God who is being given a vision of, as he inquires into things related to the seed that's to come. And that's like Psalm 22. But then there's the heart cries of someone who's under law, who is longing for, what they were longing for was really going to be fulfilled in the new covenant when God creates a new heart in them. And there's all these longings and aspirations, but there is not the availability of the perfecting of the conscience. So David writes, uh, cleanse me with his hop and I shall be clean. And there's all this sin consciousness that as a believer in Christ after the resurrection, where we have access to the holiest through the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus who offered himself without spot through the eternal spirit to God purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We don't have, that is not a pattern for us to pray and we shouldn't learn from it. We should, we should say, no, I'm without spot before God. I'm clothed with Christ. Uh, and I have access and I don't need to, you know, search my inward parts and show me my secret faults and introspect. I need to come forward boldly to the throne of grace and partake of Christ because he's my life. That's the mystery of Christ that's not available to David. Um, so th in that sense, there is progressive revelation that has yet not been revealed yet. Things have not happened yet. And so there's longings based on his predicament of where he's at that would not be correct for us to pray in this dispensation. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me and all these things, you know. Um, okay. But then there's erroneous human sentiment also recorded in the Psalms. And mainly I'm speaking of times where the psalmists would pray according to their own righteousness and say, you know, according to my righteousness, reward me. But if I've done anything in me, then punish me severely and judge me. You know, if you find any fault in me. Well, that's a person who's not embracing truly at the time he's writing that what we know you know that there's nothing good dwells in the flesh we don't want god to deal with us in that way if god were to deal with you according to what you are in the flesh he would find nothing good in you and that psalmist is crying out for judgment upon himself but it's because he thinks his hands are clean and he's now asking god to reward his righteousness by works, by punishing his enemies uh, and bringing wrath upon them. Not because of God's righteousness in Christ, 
but because of his own righteousness. That's erroneous human sentiment. And you can find examples of that in there. Well, does that mean the Psalms are not inspired? No, there's another level of inspiration where God preserves the whole thing to show you the whole thing. You know, it's multifaceted. Um, so it's inspired in the sense that God supernaturally preserved and made sure that all that stuff is in the scripture and in exactly the right place. And it even has evidence of his signature, but not all of it is according to the doctrine of Christ. Some of it contrasts the doctrine of Christ. And the best example is Job's friends who speak at length stuff that most Christians can't discern. They don't understand why God rebuked Job's friends for what they said because it's in this flowery King James language usually when they read it and they don't understand and it all sounds Bible to them and and what they they say is that Job lost everything because of some secret sin and if he didn't have some secret sin in him then surely this wouldn't have happened to him and surely God is judging him for his sins and that wasn't the situation at all and and they were appealing to works righteousness and they went on for like two three chapters doing it and God preserved it all okay so what is that? They are speaking error, and God rebukes them. Is Job not inspired? Should Job not be in the canon? No, you have to rightly divide the word. So, okay, so that's what I've said about the Psalms, and that's what I've said about James. And people who are my subs know this. I've written a book on James called James Trouble. It's really not that long. You can get it for free from my website. Um, speaking of books, I have books in ebooks and books in print, and I've made my ebooks free for everybody. And these wolves are taking advantage of that and downloading my books for free and then trying to use it to find grounds to accuse me. Uh, so and the things that they're accusing me are all just absolute either they don't understand what I teach or they don't understand what the Bible or they're lying and what we find is when we say hey I didn't say that he didn't say that they just double down and then they start really calling you um, sat satanic witch you know cult leader and a liar and a you know and tell and people when they they come to their walls and they'll say, he didn't teach that. Where, show me where he taught that. They call them satanic dogs and say they're... Exp There's no reasoning with these people. And I think that it's pretty clear that they're off the rails. But you may be here wondering, well, what does he teach? And that's basically what I teach about James and Psalms. Um, but I have a whole bunch of books in print and in uh, uh, ebook for free. And I have an AI system that has as the back end all my transcripts and all my books. And I've been working on this for about a year, but I call them Eliezer. And at this point, Eliezer is giving really thorough, nuanced, and solid answers about what I teach. And he's limited so that he it should only if if he can't if he can't find it in the transcript he's not supposed to comment on it he's not supposed to elaborate in the past I had some things where they it's hallucinations where they're going off off script so to speak um, the trick was figuring out how to get the database to respond with the right transcripts and the right book sections uh, based on your query and now I've got it where you can ask, does David Benjamin teach this? And you'll get a solid answer uh, with some video references. And I'll add to that. I've also got a section in the reading room where you can ask what I teach about my books, where it actually gives you sections of the books that he's qu quoting from. That section needs to be overhauled. Anyway, um, I'm gonna work on that a little more and make a fact checker section. Uh, where you can really 
it, it won't go into these elaborate answers. It will just say, here's, yes, this is what he taught, and here's the words. And it'll print out exactly where it's getting in the transcript and just quote me. Um, so use that, but I want to say to my subs, you know, I'm doing all this stuff for free, but it costs me an extremely a lot of money. <laughs> uh, it's costing me several hundred dollars a month. And it's been my quest, and no, people have not really supported me in that, in, in the AI thing. They don't like it, but it's becoming very useful. I watch the back end, I see what people are asking. There's babes in Christ who are getting their questions answered. Those community posts, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, the, there's edifying content that's helping people. And I don't have enough hands to answer all the questions. And I knew I needed to do this because I was going to come under more and more fire. Um, I needed to have something that would substantiate what I actually taught, you know. And uh, the technology came along right at the right time. But here's what I want to say about the books. There are people who are telling me that they've found my books, not on my website, but from my where I create them. And... Um, I don't want to say the name because I don't want you to go look for them, but the only way I can print books on demand is by a system where I actually buy them from myself. They print them at the warehouse near you and then uh, ship them to you. If I were to try to self-publish any other way, I would have to buy thousands of books in a box and store them in a warehouse and pay all the shipping costs and the handling fees and there's no way. I would be just, I would not be broke, I'd be poor. And there's no way I could write as many books as I have. I could have one book, you know. Um, so the thing is, is people are going to my site and they see I have books and then they go look and they find it elsewhere on the internet and they buy it thinking, well, this is so much cheaper. This is like three times less. Well, the reason it's three times less is because I'm buying it from myself when people order to me. So I drop the price down as low as I can to keep my cost down. Um, when they order it from my site, I go buy it from myself and send that to them. So uh, if you go find, you know, this other source and don't buy it from my website, I'm paying you to read my book. It's more, it's worse than giving it away for free. Um, because it does, I don't get any money from that and it doesn't pay for all the tools I use. And I mean, my bills for handling this stuff is about five, uh, 500 a month, I think. And I, you know, I'd have to go get a job to pay for that. <laughs> if everybody bailed and only got my books, my eBooks for free, you know, and didn't buy any of the books. The only way I can make this work is if people buy the print books. Um, so if you've been, and I have one other thing, and I don't bring this stuff up very often, but um, I have a membership thing where you can pay a monthly amount, starts at $10, you can pay whatever you want, uh, to support the ministry. And you don't get anything really from it, no special access, but it's just a monthly automatic thing, and it helps defer some of the costs and I, I don't have very many members um, but I do need support you know I, I think that among everybody I'm pretty unique in this community because number one most of the teachings come here first and then other people are teaching the same thing that's one of the reasons people call us cult it's because people actually get into the word and then they start teaching the same way I teach but they heard it here first um, number one. And number two, uh, I produce all these materials that nobody else has been able to do yet. And especially with the database thing and the AI thing, it's at a whole different level. Um, the resources that are coming and are available from my site are unlike anything you'll find anywhere. And I know that, and I'm not boasting. It's just what the Lord has done. However, and I don't believe in begging for money. I do trust the Lord. There are times, though, where I just need to make everybody aware. Look, don't go buy my books somewhere else. If you want to help, buy the books from me. 
that'll at least help me cover my costs. But I'm not even talking about what it costs for me to live. I'm just talking about pay my bills for doing this thing. Um, but things are a little tight. Uh, things are tight right now. I'll just say that. And I'm, I'm uh, going, I need to let people know that this stuff is available. I don't want to turn my channel into a merchandise channel or, or make people, uh, you know, I'll always talk about, you know, buy this or anything like that. But if you've been blessed by this ministry, please consider supporting. Uh, and I need to do a, a message like this maybe once a month where I just remind people that these things are there. Um, and then leave it at that. Try to keep it simple. But so that's the thing. Um, you can ask Eliezer what I've taught and you can get. He, he is generating content directly from my teachings. He's just paraphrasing what I taught, if not directly quoting it and assembling it into a well-ordered paragraph. And then down under his response, there's five videos uh, right now that are most relevant to what he shared. Um, so it's, it recommends videos and gives you the overview from my perspective. Now, depending on how you ask the question, uh, there are still some surprising responses. Although at the last few tweaks I did, I have not seen anything where he's responded contrary to what I teach. So I'm hoping that I'm there now. I had to, <laughs> it's a, it's a tough dance to get the right amount of information to him at the, it, but it costs more. The more information you give him, the more expensive it gets. And finally, this time I was just like, I can't afford to have him giving any answers that are not according to what I teach. So I'm going to give him the whole, the kitchen sink. So I'm giving him, uh, 32 to 40,000 tokens of information each time tokens are words essentially uh he's getting like a, the equivalent of an entire book every time you ask a question and all that data goes through the back end um and it's cost per token so the and people are using it more so the reason i'm bringing this up is because my costs are going up um as this scales up and more people are using it and ironically a lot of them are my enemies who are actually looking for reasons to accuse me and i'm paying for them to do it please if you want to support I, it would be greatly appreciated but it's between you and the lord you're not going to get any rewards or kudos i'm not going to give you a badge or make you feel special <laughs> i might not even have time to write you a thank you email but i do appreciate everybody who has supported i just need that monthly you know knowing okay this is really helping people and they see the value and they're actually contributing because they want this to grow the next thing i i do want to somehow invest in is to expand the reach of my books and website uh with google rankings and stuff like that right now it's all hidden and nobody knows about it unless they are on my channel and i mention it <laughs> so i don't have any advertising or anything like that but I am going to try to grow it a little bit um, and expand the reach of these books. They, I think they're good and they need to get in people's hands. All right. Uh, that's it. Take care.